This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Young. Joining us today for episode 124 is Philemon Foundation editor and translator, Professor Martin Liebscher at University College London. He is a graduate of the University of Vienna, where he earned a master's degree in philosophy and German studies with a thesis on the influence of Schopenhauer's epistemology on a young Friedrich Nietzsche and a doctorate in philosophy with a thesis on Jung's seminar on Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In 2002, he joined the staff of University College London, where he worked as a lecturer in the German department and taught at the Center for European Studies and in the psychoanalytic unit of the Department of Clinical, Educational, and Health Psychology. In 2009, he became an associate professor in the German Department and Health Humanities Center, and in 2017, became the principal research associate in the German department at the university's School of European Languages, Culture, and Society. Professor Liebscher has also taught in the German department at the University of London. He co-founded the Ingeborg Bachmann Center for Austrian Literature at the university's Institute of Modern Language Research and served as their director from 2002 to 2011 when he became a member of their advisory board. From 2006 to 2011, he served as senior lecturer at the Institute of Germanic and Romance Studies at the university's School of Advanced Study and now serves as an affiliated fellow. Since 2018, he has been a member of the editorial board of FANES, Journal and Network for Young History, and since 2022, has been working as a visiting lecturer at the Institute for Depth Psychology and Psychotherapy at the Dresden University of Technology. In 2011, Professor Liebscher began working as an editor and translator for the Philemon Foundation, the successor to the Bollingen Foundation, completing the works of C.G. Jung. He is one of the translators of Jung's Black Books and is the editor of Analytical Psychology in Exile, the correspondence between C.G. Jung and Eric Neumann, as well as two volumes of Jung's lectures at the ETH Zurich, Volume 6, Psychology of Yoga and Meditation, and Volume 7, Jung on Ignatius of Loyola's Spiritual Exercises. He is also the co-editor of the forthcoming Volume 5, Psychology of the Unconscious, and Volume 8, The Psychology of Alchemy. His edition of Jung's 1937 volume on alchemy and individuation is due to be published next year. He is the author of Libido and Will to Power, C.G. Jung's Engagement with Nietzsche, and co-editor of Thinking the Unconscious, 19th Century German Thought. Please visit our website, speakingofjung.com, where you will find links to everything discussed in this episode in the show notes. This interview is being recorded on Wednesday, August 23, 2023, through the magic of Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Liebscher. Thank you for having me. So we are here today to discuss your body of work. And I would like to begin with what you do at UCL. You are a professor. Would you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, of course. I'm at the Department of German of the of SELKS, the School of European Languages at uh, University College. And there I work closely together with Professor uh, Sonu Shamtasani, who uh, you will well know uh, from uh, his red book and uh, research into the history of psychology and especially analytical psychology. We work together at the Philemon Foundation. My main uh, in the main part of my work at UCL is research. So I'm teaching some courses on history of psychology and, and German literature. Uh, but my main my main work is research related. Um, and as such, I have, as you mentioned, I have done work for the Philemon Foundation, especially uh, 
the correspondence between Jung and Erich Neumann. And for the last seven years, if I'm not wrong, I've been working on the ETH lectures that Jung held at the ETH Zürich from 1933 to 1941. So my main interest in Jung, or the, let's say in, in the timeline of Jung's work, uh, is the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where I came from. You mentioned my, my PhD that I did about 20 odd years, years ago on uh, the Zarathustra seminar that Jung held from 1934 to 1939. And from that, I, I was always interested in the political context of the time. I was interested in Jung's uh, Jung's work in the 1930s and um, it just happened to be that uh, there was interest in the publication of the Neumann letters and so I, uh, I just continued this interest in the 1930s and the history of analytical psychology at that time by looking into the correspondence of Jung and Neumann then there was the next project, the ETH lectures, also the same time, the 1930 uh, volume on alchemy and CCG that you mentioned. So, yeah, and these are the projects I've done over the last years at uh, University College. But besides that, of course, I'm, I have the obligations of a professor or of teaching, of um, um, transmitting my knowledge onto younger generations. And uh, luckily, also together with Sona, we have a few very, we had a few and we still have a few very smart PhD students who are doing their work on Jung and uh, history of analytical psychology. And uh, yeah, we're very proud of those students at our institution. You mention Professor Shamdasani, and together with him, you were one of the translators of Jung's Black Books that were released in 2020. I did an episode with Professor Shamdasani. It's episode 75 of Speaking of Jung, all about the Black Books. Yesterday, I was looking through them and remembered that there is a section at the back of volume one titled Translating Jung's Runes. And it was written by you, John Peck, and Sonu Shamdasani. And the runes are a very interesting part of the Black Books. They're in volume seven. And I was wondering, I know we're not going to focus on that today, but if you would just say a few words about the work you did along with Drs. Peck and Chandasani, on translating those runes. First of all, it was the work of translating Jung's Black Books. And um, within the Black Books, there are, there are these runes, um, a particular way of writing um, that needed to be what still needs to be understood and deciphered by, by the readers and, and much more so by the translators. So the, the runes in this translator's note, it was supposed to be a translator's note. So this, mm -hmm. this is the end of the introduction, translating right. this room. Um, and neither John, no, so no, no, I thought that we would do justice to this huge project and these years of work by just putting an ordinary translator's note here. Uh, there was so much to say yeah. about what we were doing, how we were doing it. Um, and, and it's not 
that the runes become then a kind of symbol for Jung's writing in the Black Book. No, they are within his writings and within the message that he gets um, and that he transmits. Uh, there's a particular way of a particular message that we get via a certain way of writing using runes. And um, the interesting thing is that this is linked with the movement of uh, yoga and, uh, and the idea of the physical, uh, physical movement. So the rune is something that is physically emulating or that is emulating the physical um, movement of the body. So in that way, so the room gets some kind, becomes a particular way of expressing something via the movement of the body. So what is the body? What is the meaning of the body? And what is the meaning of, of a message that is transmitted via a certain movement of the body that is then uh, depicted in a form of a room? So, and, um, but it, to come back to what the, what the whole project was about, it is, it is interesting the way we worked at that time. Um, so it was all as we are here on, on Zoom on, because John Beck was in, in the United States um, and Sona and I were here in, in Europe. So we met on a regular basis to, to work together and to go through the translations. Um, and usually you would have one translator working on this okay. um, and then someone else was checking, but we were three of us. Mm. So it was me getting the German into um, an, an English uh, form that was then shaped by the poet John Beck. And uh, again, um, revised by the historians uh, and especially by Sono. So there was a kind of um, a very interesting process of translating, revising, checking, um, which uh, took us many, many years. Um, and uh, for me, in particular, the most challenging part was. Uh, the first, but the first volumes um, where they are the parallel to the Libanovus, to the to the book, to the revised version of the notes of the black books, because Jung took that, um, he changed some not a lot, but he left something out. He maybe there's a word that you don't like, just like as you do when you revise a text. Right. Um, so, so that had been translated and ready for the Red Book and not to do a complete new translation. So the translation of the Red Book and the, from the German Liber Novus had to be in line with the Black Book. So then going back to the English translation, but adding what Jung had actually deleted mm. when, when he revised that text. So that was an, um, yeah. a very, very tricky and difficult process. Um, that, um, but um, I think we we managed to to rem to keep the feeling of the red book and to to make it uh, understandable that we are getting actually one layer back in the development of that text. So that if you read the black books of the first part, that actually this is the original and the red book comes then as a revision of that. Yes. So um, and that to preserve that kind of uh, feeling. Um, so to go back in time here, so to speak, that was the challenge. Um, the later books, seven, where there's actually complete new material that was not uh, in the black books as such. Uh, 
That was more straightforward in terms that, of... That was not in the red book, right? It was not in the red book. So after 1917, the material, um, most of it uh, is new in the volumes of the... Um, later volumes of the of the black books. So that was, in a way, a different way of translating and a different task than the first part where we had to slide in paragraphs, mm. words, finding the difference, spotting where did you change anything in the German to then make the parallel corrections and changes in the English. Um, um, so that is, for me, that was working on rooms, if you so want. But within the Jungian uh, text, of course, uh, the rooms, um, we try to make it explicable to people uh, what this means and what Jung is, how you can decipher this via the understanding of the physical movements. Um, so... And you and yeah. you even called it rune yoga. Exactly, that was a, a term that uh, John Beck came up with from a from a German scholar. Um, that uh, yeah, from the nineteen fifties, I think, uh, and to coin this phrase, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you all did a tremendous amount of work and we all appreciate it. I, I know I do. How how many years did you work on the Black Books? Uh, I, I think credit goes mainly to Sonu, of course, uh, Shandasani, who did the editing work. And uh, I don't know how many work years he worked on it. Yeah. Uh, the, the translation, I <laughs> it looks... Maybe it was five years, around five years, I think, we were working on the translations. Um, so going forwards, backwards, um, it's, it's, it's a tremendous corpus. So it's a, it's a lot of <laughs> lot of things to, to, um, to think about and to consider when you translate such a text. And uh, I was really... Um, Honored to work with with yeah. a great poet like John Peck on this on this on this mm -hmm. work. So you you learn a lot uh, about the feeling for for the word that uh, he has. So that was um, that was wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. a good time. But then also it was a good time. But also what you have to say is that just to mention that also that because it's going it's going so deep into. Uh, the psyche and into the unconscious uh, it is sometimes also very uh, what do you say you, you sit at home you, you, you are alone with Jung and you are alone with the contents of his unconscious um, yeah. I assume that people who read it now uh, might have a similar experience, uh, but it is, of course, already prepared in a way. As so you have a wonderful book before you, you can make it sit at home with a cup of tea, and when it's too much, you leave it aside. Right. But when you translate, and when you then, then for me, it all you go a, a step deeper into sure. this into this world. So, and uh, so sometimes. You must put it aside because it's too, it's too, yeah, too, too intense almost. Yeah, too yeah intense. very draining, I'm sure. Yeah, draining, yes, I would say this. So less so if you go maybe to one of his later texts where he tries in an academic psychological fashion to give it a kind of conceptual framework. Mm -hmm. So that, that that is something we can, can read with some kind of distance. But mm, I see. That, that, that text uh, didn't allow me this kind of distance, I would mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now with the uh, volumes that you've edited for the Philemon Foundation, 
Some of them you translated, some were translated by others. Yeah, that's true. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually, my main, my main work for the film on, it was always the, the editing of the work. So I started, as I said, with the, with the Jung Neumann correspondence, um, which is a, is a unique work. So I've, um, I've published an article in the Journal of Analytical Psychology about the, uh, the editing work and what that entails, um, especially in re regarding the correspondence of Jung with Neumann. But of course, you, people sometimes don't really see all the work that goes into such a such a book. So right. at the beginning of at the beginning of the project, there's nothing. You have a little. You have some letters from Jung, you have some letters from Neumann, but you need to find a lot of other letters. And uh, you go to archives, you meet the families, you um, you try to, for a lot of letters, you need to find dates. So okay. they are not dated. Some of them you can't read, you have to decipher them. Mm. So there's a, very, there's a variety of very interesting works and things, tasks that go into the publication of such a correspondence before you can even think about annotations, bibliographical contextualization, historical contextualization, introduction. So, um, so that was a very interesting, interesting work um, with the Jung Neumann correspondence. Uh, I didn't translate this, but yeah, what, what you do, of course, you, you revise the text many times, the translations, and you look at it and compare it to the to the German, um, um, especially where there are difficulties. Um, with the ETH lectures, I did um, I did again, Heather McCarthy was the translator of the uh, volume six on yoga meditation mm -hmm. and um, on volume uh, seven it was Caitlin Stevens very I think a very both very talented translators um, with Caitlin I, I was particularly taken by her <laughs> very diligent and excellent translation of Erich Pschwara, um, mm. a Jesuit, uh, the, whose book uh, Deus Semper Mayo on the ex exercises of Ignatius Loyola Jung used extensively, uh, but which is written in this book Deus Semper Mayo, which is written in such a complicated style and uh, with so many phenomenological terms and um, difficult uh, neologisms. Um, so, um, and it has never been translated into English. Right. So in, if you want to read a little bit of Erich Pschwara, who was so important for this theology of the 20th century, um, especially with his concept of the Analogia Entis, uh, here, this book on Ignatius, uh, Parts of it are now available for the first time in English, mm -hmm. thanks to, to, to our Jung um, um, translation. Yeah, so the volume eight on alchemy, I have worked together on that with uh, Christopher Wagner. Um, Chris Wagner, who is an expert on Jung and alchemy, on alchemy up and foremost, and then on Jung and alchemy, who did his PhD on that on that subject um, and published a lot of things uh, on Jung and alchemy. And um, so he did the main editing work. I was more helping with the um, with the compilation of the text. So they're putting the German text together and 
together with Chris, I've translated that. Mm -hmm. And um, when will that be uh, released? Volume eight, The Psychology of Alchemy? Um, that should be the next volume, if I'm not completely wrong. So it is, it is with the publisher. It has been, it is with Princeton. Um, so my understanding is that it should be out in 2024, yeah, so, so mm -hmm. next year. Um, well, we're, we're greatly looking forward to that volume because I heard you say that it is very easy and approachable to Jung's understanding of alchemy, and you called it an introduction to Jung's psychological understanding of alchemy. And I know that there is a lot of curiosity, uh, some misunderstanding out there about the connection between Jung's psychology and alchemy. So I'm really looking forward to this. And I neglected to mention when uh, we were talking about these Eteha lectures, what exactly they are. So let's circle mm. back a little bit to what it is we're talking about. Uh, the Philemon Foundation's project to publish Jung's lectures, the lectures he delivered at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, where he was appointed a professor in 1935. And there are eight volumes that uh, were scheduled in this series. Four have already been published. The first one, The History of Modern Psychology, uh, was published in 2020. Mm -hmm. Volume two, I did an episode with John Beebe on. Uh, that's episode 109. That volume is titled Consciousness and the Unconscious. That was published last year. And then the two volumes you edited, Psychology of Yoga and Meditation, published earlier this year, and Jung on Ignatius of Loyola's Spiritual Exercises, also published this year. So I just want to add one more thing, which is how extensive these volumes are. Each volume includes a general introduction written by Ernst Falsader, yourself, and Sonu Shamdasani editorial guidelines, and this is wonderful. There's a chronology of events in Jung's career and world events in two separate columns from 1933 to 1941, followed by mm -hmm. an introduction by the editor of the volume. Yeah, um, the, the chronology, yeah, is, is printed in each of the volumes. Uh, that was a decision we we made um, because the topics vary mm -hmm. from each volume. From each volume, they are different, so it might not be that everyone buys all the volumes. Right. If someone is interested in volume eight, alchemy, um, but if we just put the chronology and the general introduction into the first volume, uh, that person will not be able to get the same kind of contextualization that um, that someone has who buys all of the volumes. So therefore, it was decided to reprint at least these things in each um, volume. The chronology is, is split into two columns. One is what happened from 1933 to 1941 during this time of the lectures uh, in Jung's life? What did he publish? Where was he? What did he do? Um, all of this information. And on the other hand, um, the what happened globally, politically, culturally. Um, of course, the 1930s uh, with the rise of na National Socialism in Germany, um, and the first world was starting in the second world in 39. Uh, so this is the, the time we're talking about, uh, crisis, uh, global crisis in the world, politically, fascism on the rise. Um, so that's the idea is to see these two, two timelines and have a have a way to see what's happening in Jung's life within the context of a broader historical frame. Um, so that, that was the idea of the chronology. And then um, 
I would like to say that I'm particularly fond of the last three volumes, <laughs> which I was involved with, but uh, volume six on yoga and meditation, volume seven on Ignatius, the spiritual exercises, and volume eight on alchemy are connected. They are connected. Okay. And this is what makes them so wonderful. Can you, of course, you can buy each of them and, and read them for themselves. Sure. Uh, but what you have is Jung's interest in the individuation process. That's, that's the overarching line here. The role active imagination plays within that. Um, and the parallels of meditation and active imagination within the Eastern context, that's volume six, parallel to that, the Western context, he says the spiritual exercises are the only uh, parallel that the West has uh, to the uh, yoga practices. And Alchemy, and that is where, where you asked me about uh, what do the, how can we see this as a kind of introduction to a useful introduction to uh, Jung's work on alchemy, mm -hmm. and this is precisely what Jung tries to show here. It, if you want, as a third column, so Eastern meditation, Western meditation, and there's um, hermetic philosophy or alchemy. Uh, with the same kind of parallel structure that he says, okay, there is actually something that equals very much my uh, psychological understanding of uh, active imagination and the process of meditation, if you want, within the individuation process, and that's alchemy. And therefore, I have the same kind of um, meditative uh, levels, uh, from one step to the next step going forward within the process of individuation that I have that I can reach via these practice ancient practice of meditations in the east and, and, and the ones in the west and, and alchemy so I haven't done it yet but I it does this wonderful this wonderful uh, columns between east and west and um prepared to parallel that and then also with the, uh, but it does not as it say does not with alchemy so with alchemy it just it would be or let's say no sorry it does it with alchemy it does it with alchemy okay. but it it does not do it uh, with his own psychological uh, model so it explains it bit by bit but it doesn't use it it does not draw a column where you say Oh, here you can actually see where the development equals uh, each other. Uh, but um, I'm just writing a, an article where I want to, where I would like to do this to make it absolutely clear. Um, when he's talking about chaos, Nigredo, um, when he's talking about Shunyata, uh, when he's talking about the first step of the uh, of the uh, spiritual exercises, uh, what is that within his psychological model of right. mm -hmm. of individuation? So that's um, that's what I would like to really carve out, so it makes it easier for people to understand these parallels. But that's if you see it from that way, you can actually see. Uh, how important alchemy is for him and mm. uh, why he's so um, why at that time he's so uh, engaged with that so um, and it's a turning point this this like this lecture the late 30s this or the mid 30s late 30s this interest in alchemy this attempt that I said, spoke to you before of writing a book on alchemy and syzygy at that time, um, at the same time as the lectures on alchemy, 
and then bringing together the Eranos lectures from the mid 30s to write the book on psychology and alchemy. Um, so here we have a, a suddenly a very a shift towards uh, alchemy interest into this, so, which of course goes back to the end of his interest into the Liva Novos and uh, but that's yeah. at the end of and then this friendship with Richard Wilhelm and so on but that's we don't need to go into this yeah so that's why you have this interest in the 1930s that period of Jung's life and his work and so I had mentioned earlier uh, his 1937 volume on alchemy and individuation and that is different from volume eight of the Eteha lectures titled The Psychology of Alchemy. So how did you come upon uh, this 1937 volume, which is due to be published next year? Mm. Uh, yeah, no, we we had the, we had the manuscript that was, we knew about it. So there was nothing that we discovered and knew. It was, it was, it was um, well known that there was this attempt to write a book uh, at the time on alchemy. And it's um, the interesting thing is that in comparison to the lectures, mm -hmm. where, where I think he really tries to, to make this comprehensible, to an audience who would not be familiar with alchemy. Mm, right. um, we have, and also maybe for himself to say at that time, okay, let's see, let's just summarize that. Let's just have a kind of where I am at that time. What do I know? Uh, and what is it, what is it for to look into this material? Um, and also, as I said before, there is then this, this frame or this, if you want, from the, um, Eranos lectures mid thirties to the to psychology and alchemy, uh, and in between we have this intense study of alchemical material in 1937 1938. He goes to India, as as, as you know, um, there he he studies at the same time alch alchemical texts, um, but that is the time uh, where he also does these uh, indexes, so uh, indices. So what he does is, uh, I don't know if everyone knows that, but uh, there are chemical books that he reads. Um, he takes notes, everything that interests him, he puts it out and he writes it into little notebooks, which are called the excerptia. Um, and then he makes an index that makes it um, possible for him to find for each particular key concept, uh, idea that is interested, the right quotations from the right of chemical texts. So, and these binding books, if you want, they are they are very, very useful and uh, to to follow the way Jung is writing about alchemy. Because if you, if you look at it sometimes, I find it that he's really putting one quote after the other. So it's like, oh, I found this. And then he looks at it and says, yeah, this fits, this fits, this fits. Of course, because that's the way he's actually working on this. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so, and the 1937, and that volume is, I think in 37, this is more or less the time that we can we can date it. So maybe a bit back, a bit forwards. Um, when he finishes that, he never finishes it, but when he actually stops writing on this fragment, uh, we don't know exactly. Um, but the material does not go into the lectures. The material does not go into uh, psychology and alchemy, a part of it is then used for his Zosimos uh, lectures. Okay. Yeah, but um, that's just a little, a little, little text. And also he has another take on it in the, 
in the 1937 volume. What he's starting with there is actually not really alchemy. He's giving a very useful introduction into his psychology. Um, and then his main interest is uh, the CCG, the CCG motif. And that's where he, for most of the of these hundred pages, um, uh, this is what he's most talking about uh, in these hundred pages. Um, and from the last, the last 20 pages, it then expands into a realm of alchemical material. Um, and it might be that at that time he was not ready to go further here or or as he said, uh, he didn't have the time to do this. Sure. Uh, maybe, maybe it was uh, that he found it more useful to expand the material from the Eranos lectures for psychology and alchemy later. Um, whatever the reason is, I I find it fascinating that especially in this time of the 1930s, where I see this this shift in his interest, a um, uh, new way, but uh, to look at things that especially at this time, he does not write a volume. He has published a volume um, of quite significance in almost every decade of his academic or psych life as a psychologist. Mm -hmm. The 1930s, which is where he writes so much, where he's at the epic of his international fame. Where, um, that, that is the, the decade where we don't have a volume of, of that uh, caliber. Um, he tried and he didn't finish. So that's, uh, that's um, what we can say and that's what we can show. And uh, it is up to the reader then maybe to see where to try to imagine where this could have led mm -hmm. if this is within within Jung's development um, intellectual development or understanding of, of psychology um, or would this have led maybe into another direction um, that's a speculative question, but uh, something that at the end of a fragment of a book, someone will inevitably ask. So where are these little notebooks that he kept that you referred to? The excerpter. Um, they are kept in Zürich uh, by the family, by the family Jung. Um, yeah, so... So those are not public. They're not public. No, no, no. And it's probably it's a. I would. I'm not sure to what extent it would be possible to publish something like that. So, what, what, what publish? Who publisher would would publish quotations? Okay. <laughs> it is fascinating to see them. And, sure. Uh, yeah. If you look, if you look at. Um, you mentioned uh, in your in your in your podcast with Sono Shandasani the his biography in books, yes. Jung's biography in books. There he actually um, has published a few pages of this excerpt, uh, so you can see in this book um, how they look like. Um, I'll have to go back and look. Have a look, and it's uh, it's interesting because he's publishing. Uh, a particular uh, notebook and the one that he took with him to India. Ah. And this is this is most interesting because it's all alchemy, alchemy, alchemy. And while he was in India, um, he took notes and did drawings of the temples. He went to the Kalaisha temple oh, okay. and he did, some, he did some drawings of that. Uh, he uh, it's at a certain point he talks about uh, the flag posts in Tibet, in Tibetan Buddhism, what they mean, or uh, so he does some drawings there. Uh, and I used this a lot for the volume six, uh, so in the footnotes of volume six of okay. the Tehalim, um, because 
he used these pages in the excerpter for his lectures at the ETH. So when you came back, he actually said, ah, oh, okay, uh, I'll tell you something about the Black Pagoda. And then, then he actually he said there uh, pretty much similar things to what he put there in the in these notebooks. So therefore, for me, in terms of editing, uh, in that uh, regard, well, they were of, of yeah, of huge importance. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the connection between volume six and volume seven. And in volume six, which, as I mentioned, came out earlier this year, uh, it's titled Psychology of Yoga and Meditation, Jung discusses the psychological technique of active imagination. And he, he looks to find parallels between the meditative practices of different uh, yogic and Buddhist traditions. And mm -hmm. he draws the connection between them and his psychology. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's, um, uh, as I said, volume six uh, from 1938, 39, um, he, he looks at uh, three different texts. Uh, the Sri Chakra Shambhara Tantra, uh, and a tantric text um, that was published by Arthur Avalon, uh, then the Amutaya Dhyana Sutra from the Chinese Western land Buddhism mm -hmm. uh, and Patanjali's Yoga Sutra. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is interesting is interested in is are the meditative practices in all of those three texts and how they are described. Um, what in all three, there is a certain um, form of meditation that asks you to imagine uh, certain images to follow certain paths of meditations. So you look first into the sun, and then you close your eyes, and then when you look, at, and then you meditate that uh, you actually... Uh, you see a lake, and then you see the lake frozen, and then you see the lap, uh, lapis lazuli color, and then you see the lotus. And so there's a different steps within this um, meditative practice. Of course, you don't do them all at once, but you will practice each of these steps uh, for quite a while until you come to the next uh, step within your meditative practice. Um, and finally, this would lead you to um, um, what Jung calls individuation, what uh, they would call, uh, yeah, uh, the liberation or the final uh, step of, um, of your meditative practice. Um, so, and that also, and then he does this with the Yoga Sutra, he does it with the Amitabha Dhyana Sutra to see mm -hmm. these different uh, steps of meditation. And uh, in the end, I mean, around June 1939, then he says, um, actually, I want to change now, switch to... A Western equivalent. The Western of, equivalent, okay. The Western equivalent of that kind of meditation. And that he sees in the, in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Um, and uh, that's how these two volumes are connected. So again, with Ignatius, we have the same kind of, uh, to a certain extent, the same kind of idea of uh, images uh, that you feel with your entire body, with your senses, uh, you smell, you hear, um, you are asked uh, to really imagine it 
imagine this kind of scenes, maybe biblical, um, yeah, most of the, the biblical context, of course. So, so that's that's uh, that's a kind of a Jung. This is a kind of uh, guided meditation that he differentiates from the active imagination to the extent that uh, he would not give you an image that you should go into uh, within the active imagination. So that comes from your unconscious. So there's, it's, it's, it's not guided, it's not given. Whereas with those meditative practices that uh, he describes, there's a certain kind of material that uh, you, you work with. And uh, there's a certain kind of dogmatism for, for that reason with Ignatius um, that Jung does not um, appreciate and uh, appreciate, but that he differentiates right. from his psychological practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Jung looked at Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises as an example of a Christian practice that's comparable to yoga and Eastern meditation. And he looks at their parallels to his method of active imagination. And it's that volume seven is more of an, a historical book. It was interesting that Jung, I, it wasn't, it wasn't what I expected. He did not go through all of the spiritual <laughs> exercises. And uh, he really just focused on the first one, which uh, deals with uh, the shadow. And he kind of, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll let you tell us. Well, I do an introduction. I, that was my, my approach to that. I was looking into the secondary literature that Jung was using or the literature that he was using to understand the um, spiritual exercises. And um, this is most of the sources that it draws on are rather critical yeah. of it. So, um, there's, for instance, uh, his contact with Ernesto Bonaiuti, who invites to the Aranus lecture to talk on the uh, spiritual exercises. Um, a man that at that time was very critical of the spiritual exercises and uh, was excommunicated from the Catholic Church oh, no. um, as a former priest uh, for being a member of um, the uh, modernist movement. Mm -hmm. Another another member of the modernist movement um, was Philipp Funk. Philipp Funk was the one who did the German uh, translation of the spiritual exercise that Jung was working with. Uh, then, um, then he was using as uh, Sebastian Isquerdos uh, comments on the spiritual exercises, the Jesuit from the 16th century, um, which doesn't give you a very modern and uh, and happy view of the spiritual exercises. So again, uh, in all of that, Jung concentrates on the first week um, on the uh work with the um shadow material what Ignatius or the Catholic Church would talk about the sin. The sins, so, yes. But, uh, with that kind of material, uh working with the idea of the uh, punishment for eternal punishment for the sins. Uh Ischiado has some very drastic drawings in his books about people in the in the inferno and so on. Uh, so that is <laughs> some of the material Jung is working on. From the modern point of view, the book that he uses at that time, as I said, is the first volume of uh, Erich Pschwara's uh, Deus Semper Major. It was three volume, but the second and the third volume did not um, come out uh, before 1940, so in a way you couldn't have known this, um, but the first volume, and Schwara is particularly interested into the um, into the prayer of the Anima Christi. Yeah. So, but the Anima Christi 
as far as I understand it, is not necessarily um, a piece of the exercises. It is a, a prayer that is used, it is a prayer that uh, is very much cherished, but it is not uh, something that uh, you need to do at the certain, there's a kind of choice between different prayers that you can okay. use. So that, that will be one of those, for instance. Um, and uh, Schwara presents it in a way as if the anima Christi is the kind of introductory prayer to the exercises and right. analyzes each each line of that and Jung just follows that in a way with his own interest in in, in the anima Christi um, and the and then it goes into the first week as I said before what we call a lot of shadow work here. Uh, the second, the third, and the fourth week, um, unfortunately, are not dealt with in the same kind of way. Also, that would be actually the interesting part. Uh, so, uh, the revelation of the of the final week. So that is uh, when you go through these exercises. Uh, that's that's. Uh, but you stopped before that and doesn't go into into uh, the end of the exercises. But with the Anima Christi, I, I have it at the beginning of my volume because that's such a yeah. wonderful thing to, to um, say and uh, to behold. Um, Jung talks later on in 1957, he talks about um, a vision he had in during the time of the seminar, the, the, the lectures on Ignatius of Loyola, and in particular on the Anima Christi. And um, here he says, when I was engrossed with psychology and alchemy, no, to be more precise, it was when I was giving the seminar on Ignatius of Loyola, once in the night, I had a vision of Christ. One night I awoke, and there at the foot of the bed I saw a crucifix. Not quite life-sized. It was very clear and couched in a bright light. In this light, Christ was hanging on the cross, and then I saw that it was as if his entire body were made of gold, as if of green gold. It looked wonderful. I was scared to death by it. Just then, I was particularly engrossed by the Anima Christi. There's a very beautiful meditation by Ignatius on it. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Professor Liebscher, and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Laura. It was an absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope that... Uh, this will encourage people to, to read these wonderful texts by Zika Jung. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com for more information on everything discussed in this episode and to access all of our previous episodes available to stream or to download for free. Speaking of Jung is also available on YouTube podcasts, which you can access by subscribing to our channel, Jungian Laura. It's free. Just click the subscribe button. Speaking of Jung is made possible by Temenos Dream, the revolutionary new dream recording app available on iOS and Android. Having trouble remembering your dreams? Now you can record them by speaking into your phone or typing them into the app. Keep your dreams organized, search the built-in symbol dictionary, and record your associations all within the app. Download it for free today by clicking on the link on the episode page or in the description below. I created Speaking of Jung eight years ago, and it's still on the air today because of the generosity of our listeners. All of our content is free to access, but it's not free to produce. Please consider visiting the support page on our website at speakingofjung.com support to help keep this podcast alive. Thank you to our recurring donors, John Temple, Ralph Gotzelman, Eric Hoops, and Doreen Gordon for their ongoing generosity and support. With very special thanks to Sonu Shamdasani and Caitlin Stevens, I'm Laura London, and you've been listening 
to speaking of Jung.